and the estimate says this out of <coughs> 543 lok sabha members of parliament 162 that is about 30% are involved in some way in criminal cases from this 162 76 are involved in serious criminal cases this is lok sabha in the rajya sabha 40 out of 232 are involved in criminal cases and out of that 16 are involved in serious criminal cases at the state level the situation is a little worst out of 4032 mlas 1258 that is about 31% are involved in criminal cases and 15% out of them are involved in serial criminal cases now these are the law givers these are the law makers this is one of the problems which we have to address ourselves i will again quote the vice president of india who chairs and presides over the rajya sabha recently he had this to say and i'll again quote every single rule in the rule book every single etiquette is being violated if honorable members wish the house to become a federation of anarchists then it is a different matter now this is not about the lok sabha not directly elected this is in the rajya sabha which of course is supposed to have a much larger caliber of people but there also the vice president of india has this to say this is very disturbing this is not only disturbing but poses an immense threat to the rule of law now friends we are going to discuss the method of appointment the best practices in judicial appointments etc at the moment we have a collegium under the supreme court judgments which is functioning and now there is a proposal to have a constitutional amendment with a judicial appointments commission now i don't want i refrain from going into the merits of that case or the merits of the clauses etc but let me share with you what happened prior to the bill having been passed in the rajya sabha i think that particular letter is in your conference bags in the middle of april of this year when reports started circulating that a bill a constitutional amendment bill is being thought of to replace the collegium the bar association of india and several members wrote a letter to the then law minister saying two things please give us a copy of this bill so that there can be a robust debate a robust debate by all all stakeholders particularly lawyers civil society academicians and others that was on 17th of april 2013 written to the law minister there was no response to it there was not even an acknowledgement i wonder whether our file with that letter got mixed up with the missing files i don't know but there is neither an acknowledgement nor any response nor did we have any intimation of what the bill is going to be and friends the letter was signed by many eminent lawyers krishnamani president of the supreme court bar association shanti bhushan phali nariman venu gopal ashok desai pp rao raju ramchandran kn bat apurva sharma shankar das mukul rodgi prashant kumar and myself now today therefore you have a bill which has been passed by the rajya sabha without debate within about 2 days of debate and the clauses of the bill were not even known to us even before the bill was moved so i thought this will be a background which i will share with you as to what happened now friends our program indicates two things one is a discussion on best practices in judicial appointments which will have to be debated in the light of the bills two bills but apart from that tomorrow 
we are going to have economic regulation and the rule of law. What is the effect of various tribunals? What is the effect of various uh, regulatory authorities, whether it's electricity or whether it is gas or whether it's a green tribunal, etc., on the rule of law? So that's going to be an important part of our discussions. And I think we have got two very eminent speakers. One is Sri Surjit Balla, who writes with a publicist, and one is a former cabinet secretary, T.S.R. Subramaniam. So we'll also have the benefit of their views. <clears throat> so these friends are some of the seminal issues which we will discuss. But before I conclude and give the podium to the Chief Justice of India, may I just, with your permission, quote what a great leader of the bar, Nani Palkevala said, as far back as 1984. It is in his the introduction of his book, We the People. And I will quote what he wrote in 1984, that's almost 29 years ago, and whether it doesn't apply to the situation which we are facing today. So Palkewala wrote, and I quote, the picture that emerges is that of a great country in a state of moral decay. The lifestyle of too many politicians and businessmen bears eloquent testimony to the truth of the dictum that single-minded pursuit of money impoverishes the mind, shrivels the imagination, and desiccates the heart. The tricolor of our national flag, the tricolor fluttering all over the country is black, red and scarlet, black, red and scarlet, black money, red tape and scarlet corruption, unquote. Let not these elements overwhelm the rule of law and it's for the younger generation to see that the flag is kept flying. Thank you, friends. I think we are all anxious to hear now the Chief Justice of India who has kindly consented to inaugurate this Rule of Law Convention. Sri Anil Divan, President of the Bar Association of India, Mr. Soli Sarabji, Vice President and former Attorney General for India, Mr. Prasant Kumar, General Secretary, Mr. K. N. Bhatt, Yakesh Anand, Mr. Ashok Desai, Mr. Fali Nariman, Mr. Andi Arjuna, Mr. Raju Ramachandran, Justice Ramana, Chief Justice Delhi High Court, Justice A.P. Shah, former, judge, former Chief Justice Delhi High Court, respected senior members of the bar, other members present here, members of the Bar Association, my lovable law students, I extend my Warm welcome to all the delegates present today at the Rule of Law Convention 2013. I foremostly congratulate the Bar Association of India for organizing such a national convention which undoubtedly has crept as a major event in the legal calendar of this country within this short span of time. The members of the Bar Association of India rightly envisaged rule of law convention as a platform for legal intelligentsia to have intensive deliberations in order to find newer and innovative ways for contemporary challenges facing the legal arena 
my best wishes for the success of this convention before uh, reading my prepared speech your president mr anil divan has mentioned about this judges uh, judicial appointment commission bill uh, as a chief justice now i am not at this moment uh, i am not going into the contents of the bill and the way in which it was passed it is a prerogative of the government and ultimately it is for the public to accept or not but he expressed to us that in spite of uh, making a request by leading members of the bar they have not received a copy of the bill for information i am having a copy of the bill in the course of today i will send a copy to mr anil dewan then other aspects at the appropriate time as far as this uh, judicial appointments uh, commission or committee uh, it is too early to say anything as far as i am concerned <coughs> and coming to our today's deliberation the first thing that came to my notice in the invitation is the title of the convention namely rule of law i wonder what prompted the organizers to opt for this subject whatever may be the reasons behind i must say that it is a subject which encompasses vast connotations with in it democracy thrives on the rule of law and incidentally all institutions and people in the setup are touched by rule of law the impact of law upon the daily lives of individuals today is such a significance that men and women not only accept its persuasiveness but also look to the law when seeking means to improve the quality of their lives ladies and gentlemen it gives me great pleasure to be here amidst you and express my views on the topic strengthening institutions to meet current challenges according to me challenge is a difficulty that carries within it an opportunity for progress in fact attaining democratic governance in our country was itself a challenge in the eyes of our forefathers and yet we have successfully transmitted to this most cherished form of government ensuring free choice voice for all and access to rights constant challenges are the marriage for development thus more challenges will give our democracy further clarity it is well known that it is well known fact that institutions are the bloodline of democracy which include elected legislature functional executives vigilant judiciary free press and specialized bodies like election commission nhrc cag these are the few institutions which are vital and constitute the life breath of the democracy and supremacy of law constant revamp and strengthening of these institutions is inevitable if democracy must flourish it is for the public to watch whether these institutions which i mentioned in the above are getting strengthened or weakened at the hands of the government recently i came across an expression namely ness of democracy this expression depicts in a nutshell how the organs of democracy must function 
structurally it is useful to conceive a democracy as a nest a ringed cluster of mutually reinforcing strands and bonds democratic systems consists of networks of interwoven and mutually enforcing relationship between key institutional spheres even a partial failure of one organ will hamper the whole mechanism of governance since the potential of these institutions primarily lies in their interactions and independence of each other democracy is such a form of governance where no one is superior to another and more importantly one cannot exist without another what i said applies both to people and the institutions in a democratic society in this contemporary era i get the feeling that institutions are losing sight of this prominent characteristics of democracy namely independence of democratic institutions this is the principal challenge faced by all the institutions in the present setup according to me strengthening the constructive interactions between these institutional spheres is the modus to face this challenge when the flow of interactions among the institutions is surfaced well the other four most but solvable challenges like poverty corruption illiteracy economic slowdown and socio economic problems can be solved without much efforts the framers of our constitution have intentionally instituted the idea of check and balance system so that we need no outsider to judge us rather our own institutions will govern each other thus every time there may seem to be difference of opinion but it need not necessarily be conflict but an intimidation for improvement only when the interaction among the institutions is healthy can the country occupy prominent position in the world of politics we should cultivate and foster such interactions among the democratic institutions if we if we envision to be predominate power in the world politics in the near future ladies and gentlemen the rule of law is the foundation of any democratic society and the judiciary is one of such institutions on which rest the noble edifice of democracy judicial function is universally recognized as distinct and separate in the system of government <coughs> it is the very heart of the republic and the bulwark of democracy thus the success of democracy largely depends upon the an impartial strong and independent judiciary endowed with sufficient power to administer justice it is the trust and confidence of the people in this great institution to deliver true fearless impartial justice that keeps the system thriving irrespective of shortcomings like backlog of cases which is fast growing to view from a positive side these backlogs are indication of awareness among the people although we must not be soothed by this fact as we definitely have to 
devise a mechanism to unravel from these backlogs. Stopping for a moment, uh, as a head of the this judicial family, I agree that we are struggling to clear the backlog of cases. At the same time, as observed by the former Chief Justice of India, Justice Kapadia, in one meeting he mentioned that, uh, rightly, uh, we need not uh, uh, take this uh, arrears as a minus point for the judiciary. Nowadays, you remember, even for getting a LKG seat or for MD physician or something, everybody is going to court. Instead of approaching the executive and giving some time to them to react and respond, many people are approaching high courts and supreme court. Though it is a welcome sign, but at the same time, uh, it is a burden on the judiciary instead of deciding many controversial constitutional issues. Nowadays, we are forced to deal all types of cases. And it is also nothing wrong on my part to inform. Yesterday, I remember uh, Mr. Andi Arjuna, he mentioned uh, in an early hearing matter, he mentioned the litigation. It's a property dispute started 20 years ago. The parties are not in a position to settle. The matter is now held up in the Supreme Court. So an early date may be fixed for the disposal. Now I utilize this opportunity to convey a message to the members present there. I said I am anxious to do more. That is the reason now within a short plan I collected the particulars about the cases pertaining to Prevention of Corruption Act. Arbitration, uh, SLPs or appeals pertaining to Arbitration Act and uh, the presidential reference, reference made by governors, many are still pending in the Supreme Court for several years. And interstate st dispute, river dispute, all those details are in my hand. But I am thinking with the 13 or 14 benches, very difficult to dispose of all these matters and we cannot hurriedly, being a last court of this country, we cannot rush through. I also informed Mr. Andi Arjuna in the court itself.